Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the director of the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Thanks so much for coming to our uh, third, fourth panel, our fourth panel. Um, very excited about uh, our guests and uh, speakers uh, today. I want to start off by acknowledging Jamie Baxter, who is hiding somewhere. There's Jamie right there. Jamie Baxter is from the law school, and he actually was uh, instrumental in organizing today's panel. I'll also note that Jamie organized a fabulous uh, conference last year in food law and policy uh, at the law school uh, and brought people from across the country and from different corners of the world to discuss food law and policy, which is an area of uh, emerging interest. Uh, it's an emerging interest in a number of institutions, but I would say it's also a growing interest here at Dalhousie. Uh, first, as I say, the law school has shown uh, increasing interest in this area. Also, in 2014, uh, Dalhousie partnered with the uh, Agricultural College to strengthen our agricultural hand. Of course, the faculty management, we have uh, environmental studies here. Uh, but really, we're seeing an emerging interest on campus. Also, a lot of students show a lot of uh, a growing interest in this. Uh, when you ask students to write policy papers, and I know a number of the students in the class are working on uh, different policy areas. Questions of food policy, food security are really top of mind issues for a lot of students. So we can see there's a lot of interest. Um, I would say uh, one of the uh, more significant uh, steps forward we've made to the faculty management is the appointment of our, our very own dean, uh, Dean uh, Chalabois, who is a food distribution and policy specialist. And uh, Sivan will be chairing our, our panel today. I'm delighted he will be. He is the author of five books, including Global Food Systems, Era of Risk Intelligence. He's published many, many, many peer-reviewed and scientific publications in his career. I can't even bring myself to say the number, Sivan, because it's too many, and it'll make all the other academics in the room feel bad. So just to say he's a very, very uh, productive researcher, uh, a really uh, um, academic leader in this field, so we're really happy to have him chairing. He's an advisor to several governments. He's also been a visiting professor in Brazil, China, Finland, and Austria. His current research interests focus on food distribution, security, safety, and traceability. I'll just make one other note perhaps to say that uh, tonight, Dalhousie and uh, particularly faculty of law, management, arts, and social science will be hosting a panel on legalizing cannabis. Uh, Sylvain will be on that panel, as will Daryl Dexter. So uh, on that note, I'll just hand it over to Sylvain. Thanks, Sylvain. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you all. Welcome. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank Kevin and his team for inviting us uh, to talk about a very important topic, agriculture and food. Uh, it affects us every single day, at least three times a day, perhaps even more. We don't necessarily realize it, but it is around us. It connects us all. Uh, today, uh, I think we have an outstanding panel. Uh, you have a great panel in front of us, and I'll introduce them one at a time. The focus is going to be around uh, primary production. Uh, the title of the panel is Farms, Fisheries, and Food, Canada's Next Generation of Food Production. Um, quick question to the audience. How many farms do we have in Canada currently? Take a guess. Two million. <laughs> not, not, not that much. 193,000 according to the 2016 census. That is uh, much lower, much lower of a number than uh, in 2011. So we've, we're losing anywhere between 6 to 7% of all our farms in this country right now. Most provinces are losing farms. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? What is going on? What is the average age of a farmer currently? 55. 55. Correct. You, you've done your homework. Excellent. It's 55 years old. What does that mean to agriculture in Canada? Cash receipts in Canada for, for coming from farming is $69 billion every year. If you look at food service and food retailing, uh, it represents an industry of $200 billion. It's a big, big chunk of our economy. And every day we get up and we take it for granted, unfortunately. Most of us, not all of us, if you're in this room, you probably care mo more than the average Canadian, which is great. But we often, unfortunately, we often take our food systems for granted. 
So I'm very pleased uh, uh, by the Leadership Institute to give us an hour and a half to talk about this very important topic. So on our panel today, we have uh, Frank Dunn, uh, who's Deputy of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, in the province. We have uh, Megan Bailey, uh, Canada Research Chair in Marine Affairs Program at Dalhousie University. Welcome. We also have uh, Geneviève uh, Grossenbacher from uh, USC Canada, who just uh, is joining us from Gatineau. Correct. Yeah, welcome. And uh, finally, we have Amanda Peters uh, from uh, Glue's Cap Ventures, who just flew in from Germany a few days ago. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, our first panelist, which is Frank Dunn. And so each panelist will have 10 to 11 minutes to talk uh, to the issue, to, to talk about uh, agriculture, uh, in their own opinion, with, and provide us with, with their opinion of what is the future of ag agriculture and fisheries in Canada. And then we'll have a Q&A session, and I know that there are a few students in this room who have prepared very difficult, challenging questions for our panelists. So let's start with Frank Dunn. Frank Dunn has 34 years of experience with the provincial civil servants, uh, service in a range of senior roles. He joined the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and Aquaculture as Deputy Minister with the province uh, just in December of 2016. I think that's when we met, actually. You were just rolling into a new role. Uh, he has served as Deputy Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, he also has served as Chief Operating Officer and Associate Deputy Minister at the Department of Education and Early Child Development. And also, previously, he was the Executive Director of Policy and Planning at the Department of Finance. So if you look at a piece of the government, Frank as was probably involved with it at some point in his career. So please join me in welcoming Frank Dunn. Um, so thank you, Sylvain, and uh, thank the, uh, the Institute for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, as uh, the kind, gracious biography said, I've been around for a while. Uh, I have one of the, uh, I think, one of the unique jobs in the, in the provincial civil service in that I'm responsible for both agriculture and fisheries, so you're going to hear a little bit about both uh, in my presentation. Uh, and what I thought I would do uh, is kind of set the context a little bit for you, uh, primarily around uh, Nova Scotia, and then talk about the challenges and talk about uh, opportunities that I see that we may have in, uh, in Nova Scotia. So, uh, first of all, uh, the need, and I think the need is something that we are all aware of. Uh, some of these numbers actually surprise me a little bit and in some ways uh, contradict uh, each other, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this topic is so interesting and uh, we can have lots of good debate about it. Uh, but in 2016, Canada was ranked eighth out of 113 countries on food av affordability, availability, quality, and safety. Uh, and that was actually done by uh, the magazine, uh, The Economist, uh, a think tank, I actually did that survey. So that would make you think that Canada is not in too bad of a shape when it comes to the, the, the global environment. But if you look at uh, numbers from 2011-2012, uh, you will see that over a million Canadian households were living with moderate or severe food insecurity. And food insecurity is really about when an individual cannot access affordable food uh, and nutritious food. So um, on one hand, it looks like we're doing good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it doesn't look like we're doing so good. Uh, I can tell you that a million Canadians, I'm told uh, by my staff, equates to about one in every 10 households in Canada at some point has uh, moderate or severe food security. So with regards to the drivers, what's driving the, uh, the discussion that we're having with regards to food po uh, policy? Uh, there's definitely a demand for food globally. 
You can see that the world population is projected to grow from 7.3 to 9.3 billion by 2050, and that will require food production to increase by about 50 percent globally. Uh, agriculture is the single largest consumer of water in the world and makes up a fifth of all greenhouse gases. So uh, you often can't talk about agriculture with, without talking about climate change as well. Uh, and finally, global per capita fish consumption has risen by 20, kilo, or 20 kilograms a year since 2016. And this is the first time that we've reached that uh, 20 kilogram number, and it's more than double what the consumption was in 1960. So it all shows us that the demand for food is going to continue to grow over the next little while. So currently, uh, agriculture and seafood uh, are strategies that uh, are extremely important uh, for the government of Nova Scotia. And uh, you heard Sylvain talk a little bit about uh, Canadian numbers. I want to share with you some uh, provincial numbers. Uh, the firm cash receipts in 2016 uh, were almost $600 million. And if you break that down by commodities, our number one commodity uh, in the province from a uh, cash streets perspective is dairy, uh, poultry, fur, eggs, field vegetables, and uh, finally blueberries. On the fish side, uh, our harvesters have harvested almost 270,000 metric tons of commercial fish in 2016, and that had a landed value of 1.21 billion. Our major uh, uh, fish uh, commodities include lobster, crab, shrimp, and scallops. Uh, I would be remiss, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about this. Uh, when we talk about uh, fisheries, I'm also responsible for aquaculture in the province. So it's not only the commercial fishery that we're talking about, but also the aquaculture operations. Almost 8,000 metric tons at a value of about $55 million in 2016. And the last bullet is very important for, for Nova Scotia. So at least from a Nova Scotia perspective, uh, we can't talk about food policy without talking about the economics of food policy, and that was referenced in the, uh, the opening comments as well. Uh, our international exports for agriculture products is about $350 million, and on our seafood side, $1.8 billion. We make up about 40% of the seafood exports in Canada, uh, and our goal is to double the 1.8 million. So uh, our major export markets, which is important to remember when I get into some other uh, topic areas, on the agriculture side, it's the USA, uh, followed by the European Union, followed by China. On the uh, seafood side, once again, the USA is our big trading partner, followed by China, which has jumped over the EU, and finally, EU uh, is our third uh, largest trading partner. Just quickly on, on sector employment, um, the average total employment, both full-time and part-time, in primary agriculture was almost 4,000 workers uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia in 2016. Important to note that that is down uh, by about 17%. Uh, the question was asked how many farms there are uh, in Canada, there's about 3,900 uh, current firms in, uh, in Nova Scotia, and that's down 17% since uh, 2015. On the fishery side, uh, seafood processing has grown uh, by almost 5,200 uh, uh, full-time or part-time workers, but the actual harvesting of fish and, and employment in aquaculture has actually decreased over the same time period. So what are our challenges? Uh, and uh, it's really where the challenges and the opportunities come together and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some discussions on those challenges. So with regards to labor limitations and available skills and numbers, uh, we have both a, a issue with the number of skilled workers when it comes to uh, farming and fishing and the notion that farming and fishing uh, is a non-skilled uh, occupation could be further from the truth. And all you need to do is go to a place like the Ag College 
uh, in, uh, in Truro, I should say the Dow campus, the agriculture campus in Truro, uh, to see that. Uh, there was a, uh, a question around what the average age of a farmer was. The average age of 55 60% of all farmers in Nova Scotia are over the age of 55. And more concerning, less than 7% of the farmers in Nova Scotia are under the age of 35. So a very, very uh, older uh, workforce when it comes uh, to agriculture in Nova Scotia. Talked a little bit about climate change. Uh, won't get into it a whole lot. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, we had uh, one of our severest droughts in Nova Scotia last summer. Uh, some would say it's climate change. Uh, if you look at fish species around the world and you start to see them showing up in, in places that uh, normally you wouldn't find them, like the right whale, which has been uh, uh, in the media a lot uh, this year, uh, some scientists uh, would suggest that a lot of it has to do with climate change and species chasing their food. Uh, cost of production and, and outdated equipment, uh, particularly in Nova Scotia, we have an issue uh, in trying to improve efficiency in, uh, in uh, agriculture and uh, fisheries, and uh, we have a lot of outdated equipment. So there's a, a big demand uh, for capital there, which leads into the next question, the availability of capital and financing. Uh, is, uh, is a concern, and when farmers and fishers were surveyed, this was the number one barrier uh, that they noted uh, for them in the industry. Uh, there are a number of organizations in, uh, in Nova Scotia that provide financing, whether it's the Farm Loan Board or the Fish Loan Board. Uh, there's also a federal uh, farm credit uh, bureau, all of which try to uh, uh, provide capital financing. The second most, or the second barrier that came up the most in this survey was unclear regulatory processes. So both at a federal and a provincial level, farmers and fishers are unclear as to what the regulation is. I'll have to hurry here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and finally, global competition. I mentioned that uh, the U.S. is our number one trading partner for both fish and agriculture. As the exchange rate goes, so go the profits uh, for companies that are involved in agriculture and fisheries. I have two slides. I'll go to them very quickly. Uh, the opportunities that we have, uh, recently the Canadian Agriculture Partnership was uh, uh, signed in Newfoundland this year. Uh, it is a $2 billion program uh, uh, countrywide. Uh, the six priorities, I won't read them, uh, they're there. Uh, the province recently signed the Atlantic Fish Fund, which is a $450 million seven-year fund which uh, Atlantic Fisheries will be able to access. Uh, the three pillars that folks can access are there. Uh, I'm sure you talked about the national food policy in your class. Uh, consolidation will come to an end uh, uh, this summer and uh, the report will be released in 2018. Two trade agreements, CETA is now in effect, came into effect September 21st. 98% of the tariffs on fishery, uh, fish commodities, 94% of ag commodities will have their tariffs uh, eliminated. Big market for the European Union. NAFTA is ongoing. Uh, how that will go will be anybody's guess. One slide. Uh, Barton Report, you know a lot about the Barton Report, I'm sure. Uh, a recommendation to increase uh, global exports to 8%. Uh, Nova Scotia has their own report, the one Nova Scotia report. Uh, recommendation to double agriculture and fish uh, exports uh, by 2020. A couple of key growth strategies in wine and aquaculture. I won't get into them. If anyone has a question about them, I can answer it then. Uh, there are crown agencies which loans for farmers and fishers. We have targeted succession planning plans like Think Farm and uh, Farm Next. And finally, I would be remiss not to mention uh, the department's relationship with the Ag Campus in Truro. I meet with the dean there on a regular basis and we talk about all things agriculture and how we can uh, help solve uh, both our problems. So thank you. Sorry I had to rush at the end, but... Thank you, Frank. Fortunately, we only have like 
10, 11 minutes per, uh, right. per panelist. I do meet with, uh, with the dean over at, uh, at the Ag Campus on a regular basis, and of course we often talk about Ag policies and things we can do to make a difference in the province. Uh, lots of potential there. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Megan Bailey, and frankly, uh, I, I wish she were in our faculty, but <laughs> um, she started at Dow just a few years ago, I think, uh, two years ago, and uh, so I, I've, we've done some work already together. She's an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair in the, in, in the Marine Affairs Program in the Faculty of Science at Dalhousie University. Uh, she joined Dalhousie after a three-year postdoc with the Environmental Policy Group of, at uh, Vaganigan University. I always destroy that name, but uh, this is a very important, it's probably the number one ag university in the world, I would say, in Holland. Uh, very credible. Uh, her research focuses on how market and state approaches can combine to improve co cooperation around global fisheries governance. And uh, Dr. Bailey received her master's uh, and doctorate uh, from the Fisher Center at UBC. Her PhD focused on solutions to global tuna governance through the lens of game theory and economics. Please welcome Dr. Megan Bailey. So thanks for those kind words and for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think this talk flows really nicely from our first one, um, so that's awesome. You can see that my portfolio is not quite as large as our previous speakers. I've grayed out farms, so that's not part of what I study, um, but I do study fisheries and fish as food. Uh, and so today I want to talk about the access imperative and how that is something um, of a policy challenge for Canada in order to have... Um, fishermen as our next generation of food production, uh, as well as fish on the table for us uh, as consumers. So this is the, the thesis that I want to put forward in the, the 10 minutes that I have, which is to ensure the future of fish as food, access must be transparently and explicitly incorporated and addressed in decision making. And I hope that you agree with that by the time we get to the end of the talk. Um, for me, I actually want to address access in two different ways. So we often think about access to, to fish and fishing opportunities as livelihood opportunities so that fish harvesters can fish. Um, but I also want us to think about access to fish as consumers. Um, and that it's about fish harvesters being on the water catching fish. And it's about me as a consumer having access to sustainably caught Nova Scotian seafood in this case. The work that I'm presenting today falls under a large uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council uh, partnership grant, and it's looking at linking ocean health with uh, community well-being, and specifically coastal well-being. Um, and that's, you know, a, there's a lot of ways we can link those things. The Ocean Canada Partnership is based at UBC, and it operates with six pillars of working groups and law and policy and knowledge mobilization. But what we discovered after the kind of two years in was that there were actually some cross-cutting themes across all working groups, and those were the things we wanted to pull out and start exploring as a partnership, and access was one of those themes. And so with Nathan Bennett, I co-lead that access cluster, and we kind of undertook three beginning things of research to try to understand, well, what does the access mean uh, for us in Canada? Why is it an imperative? And today I'm going to talk about a workshop that we had in June and the product that has emerged from that. Uh, which is a paper that we've just submitted, and it's about Indigenous and coastal community access to marine resources and marine space, uh, and why that's an imperative for Canada. Um, and so I'm just putting this up there to show this is kind of a large group of people that are working on this, um, and I'm, I'm giving specific opinions of my own that are informed by this workshop, but this is a, a huge collaborative event. Um, and you can see a link up there, a small link to a blog post about that workshop if you're interested in, in what went down. Uh, this is a diagram of our access framework, and so for us, the link between ocean health and human well-being is, is access. And for us, access is the ability to use and benefit from a resource or from space uh, in the marine environment. And that, for us, is at the center, and that's what connects the ocean health with our ability as, as uh, a coastal community or as Canadian citizens to benefit from the ocean. 
So I'm going to just touch on a couple of things um, that we've concluded and things that I think draw um, uh, kind of evidence towards this need to deal with access. So the first is this idea of using and benefiting. And what I said at the beginning about both access to fish and access to fish on my plate. Um, and what we often see is that these things are a little bit disconnected. So seafood production is managed very separately from seafood consumption, value chains, distribution, and trade. Um, and so the first imperative that I want to bring forward is that we need to fix the institutional mismatches to make sure that the fish in the water can end up as fish on our plate. Um, and so what we, we, you know, we heard earlier about the One Nova Scotia policy uh, um, and, a, and a desire to double exports, uh, the value of exports. So my, my question is, where does that value come from, right? So it's either going to come from we need to catch more fish, can we do that sustainably, or it's going to come um, by some kind of value add process so that every unit of fish we take from the ocean is worth a little bit more, or we're going to export more of our seafood and we're going to keep less of it here. And a question is, is that a good thing? If we just take Nova Scotia, is that a good thing for Nova Scotians? And I saw, if I can call it Justin, I saw um, Justin from Aficionado uh, enter the room. And so they're a fishmonger that tries to connect Nova Scotians with sustainably sourced local seafood. And they can't always find enough of our local seafood, even though we're catching you know, a third of a million, t uh, million tons of fish. Um, so we're exporting a lot of that. And my worry is that when these ministers um, and ministries are kind of separated in terms of uh, a federal oversight of production and a provincial oversight of trade and consumption, we're losing that connection between fish as producers of food and those of us that want to consume fish. So if we want to keep eating fish and we're going to keep exporting Canadian fish, we're not going to know any of our fishermen. We're not going to know our fish harvesters. We're not going to have that connection with fishermen as producers of food. So that's one imperative that I think we face. Uh, the other thing is the fact that the ocean is becoming increasingly a space of competition. Um, so 50 years ago, we had mostly fishing and shipping on the water, and we certainly have a lot more happening right now. So example, marine protected areas um, and aquaculture. So we have a lot of competing uses of space, and that's altering uh, the ability of fish harvesters to access fish and fishing opportunities. And so a second imperative is to move more towards integrated coastal and ocean management, or ICOM, and just to explicitly acknowledge that these things take place in competing areas in the ocean and how can we manage collectively across sectors, across uses, in a way that is for the benefit of society, however we define that. Uh, and so this term ocean grabbing has surfaced, where governance um, and, and government uh, decisions are appropriating ocean space away from fish harvesters and it's going to something else and that causes a, a decrease in the well-being of fish harvesters if it alters the way that they can practice their, their livelihood. Um, certainly things change, so I'm not suggesting that no space should ever be taken away from fish harvesters at all, but we need to recognize that every appropriation of space comes with some kind of loss associated with it. So an imperative there for integrated management. And then finally, there are a lot of things that influence access related to um, government regulations. As we heard before, regulations are a huge barrier for fish harvesters uh, trying to navigate that. But there's also the issue of social capacity and human capacity and capabilities that fish harvesters have in order to be the next generation of food producers. So intergenerational transfer of skills, knowledge, licenses, access is a huge barrier for fish harvesters. Um, and so if we want fishermen in the future, there needs to be some kind of um, concerted effort to link our policies with promotion uh, of the next generation of, of fishermen. Um, so the imperative number three is to enact, improve, and adapt regulations such that we're, we're managing fisheries in a way that fits what we want as society. If we want fishermen in the future, we need to have policies that support intergenerational transfer of access. Um, so the Fisheries Act right now is being uh, revised, and there was mention of perhaps putting owner-operator into the Fisheries Act. And what that would mean is that those who own a license are those who are operating boats on the water, um, and that that would hope, you know, hopefully help keep access within coastal communities as, as opposed to access being um, gifted away or sold to corporations or to foreign owners. Um, also recognizing legal precedents with respect to indigenous rights, so uh, food, social, and ceremonial, but also moderate livelihoods. Um, we have rulings in place, we have a UN declaration, and, and yet we're not recognizing properly um, the rights of indigenous peoples to access uh, marine resources as well. Um, and then also to think about this move away from privatization. Um, and so 
one of the, the big issues, a, a, a fisherman who's coming tomorrow to speak in my fisheries management class, uh, he said, you know, he was at this workshop and he said, I want you to go and try to get a license. Try to get a license to fish. It is so hard to get a license as an individual to fish. You need to be part of a corporation, you need to have money, you need to have, this, again, this access to capital. So there's a lot of barriers that have um, been brought up, and that's, those aren't accidental things. They're, they're consequences of choices that have been made. And sometimes those, those choices had, um, you know, uh, positive things that we were intending from them, but they may have had negative uh, consequences as well. So that third imperative is really about regulation and recognizing the precedents that we have in place to do better. I think if we don't confront the access imperative, then Canada's next generation of fishermen will be foreign owned. Canada's next generation of fish and seafood consumers will be fed on imports. And the link between fishermen um, as food providers will be gone. And I think that's, uh, that's a bit of a tragedy. So that's it, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. Uh, great messages there. Our third panel uh, speaker is Geneviève uh, Grossenbacher, and uh, Geneviève uh, is the Policy and Campaigns Program Manager at USC Canada, and she's based out of Gatineau, Quebec. Uh, Geneviève joined USC back in 2010, uh, where her work includes coordinating uh, seedmap.org, seedmap.org, uh, an online portal on seeds, biodiversity, and food. Geneviève co-managers our little farm. Is there a French name to that? Notre petite ferme. Notre petite ferme. There you go. Uh, a certified organic farm in the province of Quebec. Geneviève co-chairs Food Secure Canada's New Farmer Initiative, and uh, she has worked at many levels of the food movement, from farm to cafeteria program coordinator <laughs> in 75 different schools and hospitals to vice president of Canadian Organic Growers, an active member of, uh, of the community for sure. Please welcome Geneviève. Thanks so much for that great introduction. I try, but uh, there's lots of great people, so I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to be with you today. And uh, actually, just while I get to, uh, how do I present to the full screen. Um, full screen, how do we get to the full screen? No, well, it's here, but, um, but before yeah, I do yeah, that, yeah. I actually wanted to acknowledge the unceded territory we are on, which I believe is Mi'kmaq territory. Um, and there you go. Yeah. Perfect, so I just wanted to talk to you a bit about, from my viewpoint, the challenges that we have in terms of supporting the next generation of farmers, which I am a part of. Uh, as, um, as Sylvain said, I do work at USC Canada on uh, food policy issues, uh, or policies, po uh, issue, policy issues that affect new farmers and, um, the, and uh, agriculture in the future. And um, uh, by the way, I don't have much time to introduce USC Canada, but I do invite you to go check it out. It's a great organization that works with farmers around the world and in Canada to help them save their local seeds. But today I'll be talking more about the role uh, that I've played in figuring out what are the challenges that new farmers face today and what do we need to do as a society to make sure that we still have farmers tomorrow. Um, and just to know about myself, I do run a small-scale organic farm. My partner is a full-time farmer. We have someone with us on production full-time. But I do very much represent the type of farmers I'll be talking about a bit later tonight. Uh, tonight, today. Uh, farmers who are not from a farming background, but who have decided to go after an agri uh, a university degree, go into agriculture and try to make it work for themselves. Uh, so we run, uh, we do about 250 CSA baskets, so we deliver boxes every day, uh, every week to, to people, and we also do, we used to do a farmer's market, but we do also uh, sales to um, local restaurants. So um, as Sylvain was mentioning, these are 2011 stats, so I haven't had time to update them, but you know, we only had 205,000 farms or so, and now it's 190-something. Uh, so we know that back then we were losing 10 farms a day, 10 farms a day across the country. In Quebec, that, that was also um, uh, 
11 farms a day, actually. Quebec was pretty bad. Um, farmers are getting older. The average age is now 55. 75% uh, of farmers currently don't have someone in line to take over their farm. And that is worrisome because we know that it takes 5 to 10 years for a farmer to find someone to take over their land. Farm size has gone up. Farm debt has also risen to 332%. So it's really hard for new farmers, especially when they don't come from a family background. And out of university, you have farm debt, uh, farm debt, school debt sometimes. You want to buy a farm, and you have to buy into like 5 million plus uh, enterprise. It's really tough to do that. Um, yet, there's a, currently about 20,000 farms uh, across Canada where there's farmers over um, under 40. And those numbers are getting up. Um, but there's kind of a paradox right now. More than ever, we need people to take over the farms that don't have anyone lined up, yet there's more and more barriers for their young people to go in agriculture. So for instance, um, when I started, it took me 10 years to find land, and I'll get back to that in a sec, 10 years. <laughs> uh, Yet, I was at a time where there was lots of people like me wanting to go in agriculture. If it takes 10 years for every one of us to find land, we, just, we won't have farming future tomorrow. <coughs> and we know that we're at a time where, um, and a lot of people are getting into farming and want to do farming in a more sustainable way, or try to find the best practices they can to make sure that we, they lower their environmental footprint, because everyone wants to be more climate resilient. So we're at a time where we need more sustainable practice. We have farmers who want to go in agriculture and do that, and yet those farmers are taking a long time to get in. Um, but there's kind of a new face of new farmers happening. I mean, th there's different profiles of new farmers, but more and more what we're seeing is that people wanting to get into farming uh, tend to be, um, instead of being like 18 to, to 30, they're more like 25 to 40 and up, often a second generation career or after university, they tend to want to farm in cooperative models or in collective ways, so, uh, and definitely often there's a couple of them. Again, university degree, a huge uh, component or a huge focus on making sure that the farms are environmentally sustainable and financially viable. That's something that we didn't necessarily see in, uh, before. Definitely, usually a focus on um, high value crops or at least getting into modes of agriculture. Like right, right now, there's a lot of people going into diversified vegetable production because um, there's not that much infrastructure required to get in or there's not that many blocks. There's, it's really hard right now to get into dairy because you either need a lot of money or a lot of infrastructure to get in. Um, and those farmers are really being innovative. Um, for instance, this is La Ferme aux Petits Oignons uh, in Quebec near Mont Tremblant. Uh, they own six hectares, and all of that, they cultivate 4.5. That's really what the land can you know, grow, because the rest is housing and greenhouses and stuff. They turn out $750,000 on 4.5 hectares. Just to put that in, in context, their neighbor across the street grows uh, corn and hay they can pull out $350 per acre on the same landscape. So we're not at all talking the same profitability. Um, you know. uh, so for a long time, the big barrier was getting the government's attention of saying, this is a model that works. This is a model that you know, actually not only does it generate revenue, but you know, it employs three, or f three to five times more people than if you did hay. Um, it's being innovative by adapting new technique, adapting tractors to make sure to work in small scales. But yet, there was, until recently, we're starting to change, uh, virtually no support for this type of agriculture. Um, so I get back to that. But there's a really uh, opportunity of uh, the, the, the new farmers right now really interested also in growing for the local market. I agree that you know export market will always be there. It's about currently one third of the domestic. Um, so right now, agriculture re represents uh, one in eight jobs is from agriculture, and of the cash receipts, two-thirds go to the domestic market, and the third goes to the export market. The government right now is focusing on the export market, which is great, but at the same time, as you were saying, domestically, there's an untapped demand for local products. We're not even tapping into that, so we really need to put, as if, in my opinion, more energy into that. Um, yeah, I'll skip that. Um, so, in, through the New Farmer Initiative that I chair at Food Secure Canada, in 2014, we did a survey around uh, the country of different farmers and stakeholders involved with New Farmers, trying to figure out, okay, if all these farmers want to go into agriculture, why aren't they all succeeding? What are the biggest barriers for them? And this, um, what we found has been echoed since then by a study that was done by the New Farmer Coalition, 
uh, that really looked like uh, really there is four big barriers for farmer, new farmers. First, access to land. So uh, access is huge. Um, prices of land have sky skyrocketed. Even in my area, uh, the bank, if you go to the bank, they'll give you $5,000 per acre usually. Um, but on, uh, on, when you go to buy the land, the land is worth often up to $50,000 per acre. So that means you have to pocket the difference. So if I want to, and in my area, the land is topography because of that. It's really hard to find, you know, a five-acre plot that I can use. I usually, to have a five-acre plot, I need to buy 100 acres. So if I need to pocket the difference, I just don't have the money. So access to land is huge. Access to finance, again, a lot of the financing is really geared towards the supply management world, which is great, needs to ha continue happening. But really, there's not a lot of financing for me if I want to start a vegetable operation and I don't have much guarantees to bring to the bank. And then I'm starting a business that doesn't need much infrastructure. They're looking at me and saying, well, actually, I was told this at the beginning of my career. If you want to go in agriculture, if you go in supply management, we'll lend you one million. If you want to go and do uh, um, vegetables, you're not talking about adding much infrastructure. We'll lend you $100,000. So not at all the same support. Access to training and extension, that has been really interesting. So what we found in the farmers we spoke to Anyone who was in the supply management or the more conventional type of agriculture has a lot of support through the schools. But the, the farmers who are really going into agriculture now, a lot of them are looking into new um, or less costly ways of doing agriculture. So soft, even in the fisheries or in the diversified uh, vegetable production, and they're getting their support from nonprofit organizations. So those organizations are core. If we want to make sure we have farmers in the future, those Organizations need to continue offering the, the training, yet these are severely um, n not funded, and the funding keeps being cut. And we were also talking in the north. There's lack of agricultural policy in the north. So in uh, the Northwest Territories, I believe, uh, there's not, agriculture is not even seen as a possibility. So if you want to be a farmer there, good luck um, getting any support. But thankfully, that's about to change. Uh, so I'm not sure how I'm doing it for time. But uh, so we had identified... There's a lot of things we can do in terms of like land, access to land, access to training, and policies in the north, but I've highlighted the ones that I think actually we have the capacity to change either through the next policy framework, the New Canadian Agricultural Partnership to, to starting to take effect in 2018, or through the food policy. We really have an opportunity to uh, look at land access. Uh, well, first, I think we can't look at land if we don't if we're not serious about looking at our relationship with indigenous people and respecting their rights. Um, so many times we've seen that actually indigenous communities uh, have proven that they conserve resources better and they have really good ways um, of managing collective properties, yet we don't address that in Canada. We need to do that. But another thing that we need to do, um, land usually falls within provincial jurisdictions, so it's a bit tricky to figure out what at the federal level we can do, but I think the federal government is really well placed right now to incentivize provinces to put in practices and, and programs for the provinces to protect their own farmland. Uh, Quebec and Manitoba have done interesting work in that sense. There's, uh, Quebec has been really good also, and I can speak more about that because that's where I'm from, but uh, really interesting programs in terms of like uh, financing programs for access to land, um, incubator farms where you go for a short period of time and then you need to move. Uh, it's really, if you don't have access to land, if you're not from a farming background, you know, that's a way, a cheap way to start your farm and figure out if you want to do it. Uh, land banks, uh, community land trusts, but one, uh, one thing really on the financial side that we must do um, is really make sure that the programs, there's a lot of programs through the policy framework that support farmers. However, a lot of them are geared towards a specific type of farming. So if you're a diversified farmer, if you're a farmer that really tries to move to sustainable practices, um, a lot of the programs by default, like in, in terms of, uh, just to give you an example, in terms of climate change, you, you some grants in Ontario you could access if you were reducing your pesticide use. But if you're an organic farmer that doesn't use pesticides, there will no compensation for you. So it crea creates a dis dis disincentive for farmers or a competitive uh, change. But anyway, lots more we can do and we can discuss later. Um, yeah, I forget. No, but I really think in the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, the Food Policy for Canada, and even internationally through our, um, uh, time is up. Lots of opportunities for us to do lots more. <laughs> Uh, I can't. 
Thank you uh, very much, uh, Geneviève. Uh, so our last speaker, again, a different perspective on, uh, on agriculture and fisheries, uh, Amanda Peters. Uh, Amanda is a member of the uh, Gluce Cap. Is that how we say it? Yeah. Gluce Cap. Uh, First Nations uh, and is the CEO of uh, Gluce Cap Ventures. Gluce Cap Ventures was created back in April of 2014. Uh, as the economic development arm of the Gluce Cap First Nation. Uh, Amanda holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Mount Allison University and holds a Master's degree in Political Science, uh, Information Management and Public Administration at Dalhousie University and a Certificate in Creative Writing from the University of Toronto. Uh, she has work from the Atlantic Policy Congress of First Nations Chiefs Secretariat. Amanda has also worked as the Director of Administration for Glues Cap First Nation. Please welcome Amanda Peters. Okay, I'm just going to find my presentation. Oh. Um, I, think, I want to thank uh, the school, or the institute, for inviting me here today. And uh, as Geneviève did, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, farms, fisheries, and food from an Indigenous perspective uh, here in Nova Scotia, but a little bit more broadly, because when it comes to issues of climate change, we have to consider the, the peoples of the North as well. So I just wrote a little agenda to keep myself on track. Uh, I'm going to keep to my 10 minutes, hopefully. So my perspective is to speak from the Indigenous policy perspective. So I'm going to go through a little, maybe, maybe boring, I'm not sure, an historic um, policy evolution for First Nations and Indigenous peoples in Canada, and then talk about the current policy framework. So traditional food production. So First Nations people have been planting food. A lot of people assume that all First Nations people are um, hunter-gatherers. While it is true for the Mi'kmaq on the East Coast, and we do have the Iroquois who cultivated the Three Sisters. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Three Sisters, but that's squash, beans, and wild rice. Um, so the Iroquois would actually plant these all together in mounds so they grew together, and they harvested them, and they used them for their winter foods. Um, the Ojibwe, while they didn't plant it, they did harvest wild rice, and you can still have Ojibwe wild, wild rice. Um, but as I said, some, as, including the Mi'kmaq here on the East Coast, were hunter-gatherers and moved inland for the winter and to the ocean in the summer to collect food. Um, so reservations and forest farming, I'm sure you're all familiar with the reservation system here in uh, Canada. Um, since uh, the English and the French came to Canada, they were taking Indigenous people and putting them on s certain parcels of land. This was all codified um, in the Indian Act of 1876, um, where they created the reserve system. So the prairie, uh, part of their plan was to assimilate First Nations through agriculture, funny enough, um, by making pe First Nations people into farmers. They thought they would bring them more into civilization, I'll put it that way. So there are new policies put into place to ensure that indigenous success would not interfere with non-indigenous farmers. So in the prairies, they were successful. The indigenous farmers were doing well. Um, they were having communal farms. They were selling their product. Um, then the government said, uh-oh, um, we got to stop this from happening because the non-indigenous farmers are getting a little riled up. So they put in three um, policy, uh, policy areas. Um, they separated the land so the indigenous people could not have large tracts of land. They could only have tiny tracts of land. Um, they made them return to peasant farming and not allowed to use any of the newer technologies. And they created the permit system where First Nations people were not allowed to farm or sell their product without government permission. So this led to the collapse of indigenous farming in the prairies. In Atlantic Canada, there was not really a lot of success because the reserve system here in Nova Scotia, the indigenous people were put on the, most, the worst land. Um, so we couldn't grow anything. And then when we did and it failed, we were blamed for not being good farmers. So you can't talk about indigenous uh, farming and fishing without talking about food insecurity in Canada. Um, so there's a lot of talk about the loss of traditional methods of hunting, particularly in the north. Um, socioeconomic risk factors, as you may already know, um, First Nations people in Canada are more likely to live in poverty, not have as much educational uh, attainment or housing issues, and this all leads to um, a lack of food. Um, 
cost of food in the north, which is really important. Um, a basket of food in Nunavut is $551. The same basket in Montreal is 237 I was up north once at a grocery store and saw a watermelon for $60. So you see a lot of First Nations people with a cart of Hungry Man dinners and Pepsi, because that's affordable. But a watermelon and a bag of apples, which is $25, is not affordable. So there's a lot of food insecurity, especially in the north, but here in the south as well. And of course, climate change. When you look at the north again, there's coastal erosion, the warming of the earth. This is taking away the ice. Um, so the indigenous people of the north can't get out to hunt. They can't get out to get their foods. Um, a loss of traditional methods of hunting. I've heard a few perspectives on this. So uh, one is that a lot of non-indigenous people are going in to tell the indigenous folks, particularly up north, that your food is full of mercury. It's all terrible. You can't hunt it. Don't eat it anymore. So they stopped when it wasn't actually true. So they've now lost all of their traditional methods of hunting, and they can't go get their own food, and it's affecting their health. They're used to having those traditional foods. So uh, again, I'm going to talk briefly. I'm not going to talk about Sparrow, but I'm going to talk about the Marshall decision. So the Marshall decision in, uh, in 1993, Donald Marshall from Member 2 First Nation here in Nova Scotia was caught fishing and selling eel um, near Antigonish. He was, uh, his traps were seized and he was fined, um, and he argued that he had the right to uh, fish eel under the Peace and Friendship Treaties. So um, in 1999, 1990, yes, September 1999, the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that he did have the right to fish for a moderate livelihood. So after that, the DFO and the government was caught a little off guard. They're like, oh my goodness, what do we do? Now all the Indigenous people are going to go out and start fishing, which we did. Um, so uh, in the Atlantic, there are 34 Mi'kmaq Malseat communities, and we were um, given the opportunity to, commer to commercially fish, but also for our, F we call it FSC, our Food, Social, and Ceremonial Fisheries. So Food, Social, and Ceremonial Fisheries has been in the news a lot in the last two weeks here in Nova Scotia, and that is where, in Gluscat, for, for example, we have one fisherman who goes out and fishes, brings all of that product to a reserve, and we distribute it amongst our community members. It works the same way for hunting. We, we ask one of our hunters to find one moose. We, we have that moose in our community, and we divide it amongst community members on a first-serve basis. We do not sell it. You're not allowed to sell it. Um, of course, there's always going to be one bad apple, but uh, the majority of First Nations do not sell their FSC. We actually eat it, and we use it for ceremony. We use it for feast, etc. However, the government also um, uh, allowed us to get into the commercial uh, fisheries. Uh, they provided $160 million um, to help First Nations communities in Atlantic Canada buy boats and licenses, generally used boats, which are now coming to the end of their livelihood or have since then, because it first started rolling out in about 2003. So at Gluscat, for example, we have two fishing vessels. We fish lobster, uh, swordfish, tuna, groundfish, Mm, that's it right now. Um, we have access to a lot more. Um, if you look at Listagush or Eskasoni or the bigger communities, they have snow crab licenses. Um, we are growing, so we have uh, just purchased, well, not purchasing, we're buying, building a brand new vessel, and we have a third lobster license. Um, so I'm trying to rush through this, so I apologize. Um, current, current policy landscape. So we do have areas where we can access fisheries and agriculture. So existing government programs that are available to First Nations that aren't necessarily, well, aren't available to non-First Nations are through the CORPS program, which is a community opportunities and readiness program through INAC, Indigenous for Northern Affairs, Indian Service Canada. They keep changing their names, so we're never really sure. Um, but they have a program where you can access funds to support economic development activities so long as it's employing your community members and bringing profits back into your community. Unfortunately, that program is going through a policy change right now where communities who have access funding and are growing quite well are not going to be able to access that anymore. So we're a little bit concerned about that. Department of Fisheries and Oceans has the ACFI program, and I had to actually look that up because we live in acronyms in First Nations world, but it means Atlantic Integrated Commercial Fisheries Initiative. So this is designed to provide First Nations with uh, capacity and money um, to develop uh, commercial fisheries. So they provide funding to hire your fishermen or a fisheries manager. They um, provide, on an application basis, they provide funding to purchase new boats, to purchase new licenses. Um, usually they only cover about 10% of it, so you have to come up with the rest of yourself, which you have to do through financing, which is impossible because uh, no ba commercial bank will finance on reserve. So it's, you have to find creative methods of, of, find, of finding money to support these initiatives. Then we have the Department of Agriculture. So in June, I think June 1st, 
Um, the Department of Agriculture federally had um, a meeting and invited indigenous, uh, interested indigenous peoples from Atlantic Canada to Montreal. That was called Eastern. And we all sat down to talk about the new framework that's coming out in 2018 and Indigenous perspectives and what we could do in the policy area to support Indigenous peoples in agriculture. So that was like pretty much the first time the federal government had ever contacted Indigenous people say, hey, what do you do in agriculture? What would you like support for? Um, but there are a lot of small-scale interesting things happening in Indigenous communities. So, for example, Abigail First Nation and Prince Edward Island, they have their own um, communal farm. They grow fr fruits and vegetables, they bottle them themselves, they pickle them, they make jams, and then they sell them to, them, to each other um, and to local people around. So um, that's just one small area, like it's tiny, but those things are creeping up everywhere, everywhere now. We have a communal farm, um, our communal uh, gardens in our community too, so every fall everybody picks them and everybody shares around. I have peas, do you want squash? It goes like that, so again, tiny. Um, and generally, as First Nations that fall under federal agriculture, we do look to the federal government predominantly, but the, uh, the Nova Scotia Provincial Department of Agriculture has been quite supportive. Um, for example, I just returned from Germany on Sunday evening um, after a, a six-day trade mission to sell our seafood. So we met with um, distributors and suppliers in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and in Germany. And we believe we've established some contracts with them to export our seafood. Again, for First Nations especially, the funding is there and the support is there if you're exporting. It's not for the domestic market. So that's maybe something we should talk about. One minute left. So overarching questions. Who will be Canada's next generation of food producers? I think there's a big capacity in First Nations communities to do this work. We have a very young population. We have a high unemployment rate. Um, we are stewards, natural stewards of the earth. We don't have to be told. We don't have to have certification. It's in our blood that we're going to take care of the earth and we're going to share. So I think there is a, a really good possibility there. And what are the key policy challenges? Barriers to access are always an issue with First Nations. Um, in agriculture, we don't have any access right now. We do fall under the same program as everybody else, like the Green Youth Initiative and stuff like that. But we would like to have a niche carved out for us because this is something quite new to First Nations. Again, it's been forced on us in the past. Didn't do too well. And when we did well, we were told no more. So access to those funds, access to the policy table where these decisions are being made would be really good. Um, address capacity issues and listen to the First Nations people when they talk. That would be lovely. So that's me. Time is up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Unfortunately, we only had 10, 11 minutes for each. Uh, I, I think all of the four panelists uh, gave you an opportunity to think about Different things, all sorts of things. Uh, we only have an hour and a half, and uh, food systems are complicated, complex. Uh, lots, lots to tackle. Uh, when I was listening to all four of you, we have lots of issues that we need to address for sure. Um, at this point, uh, I am to ask students who have prepared questions, uh, hopefully based on what they've just heard in real time, hopefully, maybe not. Uh, I think... The first contestant we have is uh, Megan. All right. Thanks for that, guys. It was really great and informative. Um, I guess my question is directed towards you, Genevieve. Um, I'm just thinking, like, another challenge for small-scale and local farmers is just the reality of international exports. So my question would be, how would we get Canadians to buy into the idea of paying more for local and sustainable food rather than seeking cheaper food that's sourced from other countries? And how do we make sure that access to local and equitable food is fair for all Canadians and not just those who could afford it? In one minute. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, but actually I love that question uh, for sure. But actually I, I would answer by saying, uh, you know, it, it's not always true, by the way, that local is more expensive. Actually, when I go to the grocery store, I've done this many times, I deliver CSA baskets. It comes to about $30 a week for the vegetables if you take them every week. Buying the same at the grocery store is usually at least 15 to 20% more at minimum. And I've done this thing in the States and it was 50% more. But anyway, um, I want to start with that. But the second thing I was just want to say that why is inter uh, international food cheaper it, when it is? It's because of all the subsidies that it gets. 
imagine like right now I can buy I can produce organic local organic vegetables at the same price or lower than the grocery store without it, virtually no support from the state imagine what we can do if we start reversing the the funding mechanisms I really think that's key and in terms of access there's so much we can do um, in terms of getting healthy food in schools having that be subsidized uh, creating incentives for people to go in that type of agriculture I really think um, yeah the ch uh, the ch there's a lot of opportunities, we just need to grab them and start changing that. And there's a lot of countries that have done that shift that have seen a lot of results in terms of uh, Brazil or France, um, France, uh, Spain. Lots of really innovative ways to get local uh, organic food accessible to everyone. So we don't necessarily pay the real cost of food most of the time. That, that, well, that's the thing. Actually, there's a really interesting uh, research being done right now. Um, I'm not sure if it's out right now. Looking at the cost uh, sorry, what you just said, but l looking at the uh, hidden cost of the food we produced, uh, so saying that we say ch food is cheap, but we pay by having more than ever food-related disease in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was one of the reasons in BC that BC had decided to invest in local healthy food. Um, local food in schools uh, is because they looked at in 10 years, with the amount of food-related disease, they just wouldn't have enough money to get all the people in the hospital. So they had to start changing the, the eating patterns of the people who eat. So you know, health is one of them, but in terms of the environment, the footprint, you, you were mentioning agriculture uses the most water. 10.3% of the greenhouse gas emissions are linked to agriculture, and 70% 70, 70 of that is linked to pesticides. We really need to look at decreasing pesticide use and investing in organic or ecological agriculture. And right now, just to give you an example of the disproportion of support, just in research and development, in 2015, <coughs> agriculture received $649.5 million for research and development. Organic agriculture only received $1.6 million. That's 0.25% of the whole pie. Organic agriculture is 2% of the market, so it should at least be that, but I would argue it's more because so many times, Organic agriculture has innovated or led to innovations that are applicable to all farmers, helping all farmers reduce their footprint. We just need to, to, to start changing where we put our money, I think. Mm -hmm. Comments from other panelists? No? All right. Thank you, Megan. Oh, do, oh sorry, Frank. I could talk about these all day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe, maybe just for folks, just in, in Nova Scotia, some of the things that we're doing uh, to try to promote... Uh, uh, by local, by local is a is a kind of slogan we use. We have a uh, we have a program called Select Nova Scotia, which is a half a million dollar program, uh, which uh, uh, is in this year's budget as well, uh, and it promotes uh, local uh, consumption of agriculture products. I can tell you that the, the Department of Agriculture has ongoing discussions with. Uh, local uh, retailers and for those of you that shop you know, you know if you go into a Sobe store uh, they very much promote local and uh, and the farmers uh, uh, and just one other comment on on the organic uh, farming and we could have a discussion about this all day and uh, um, you know I'm I have a background in science so for me uh, decisions that should be made and, and the decisions I try to make are, are based on science and, and there's all kinds of science out there but I'll leave you with this to consider I had mentioned in one of my very first slides that by 2050 uh, the uh, uh, demand globally for food would increase by 50 percent and so um, the question I'll leave with the group is 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 can the world uh, get to that 50% without considering using pesticides and herbicides to get there. Um, uh, considering that you would need to consider that in a science-based way. So maybe I'll leave that as a discussion that we might have later. Happy to engage on <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Um, our next student, now I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to uh, check with uh, the student how to pronounce uh, the name Sauben. Sauben? I'm sorry, you Siobhan? Siobhan, yeah. Siobhan. Hi, so I'm Siobhan. Um, my question is also for Genevieve. Uh, you mentioned that agriculture is currently limited in Northwest Territories, but that it's about to change. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what changes you envision? Mm. Uh, good, and I, I'll probably want to turn to the other panelists for that, but uh, 
asking about agriculture changing in, in terms of more production in the in the north. This way. Yeah, um, just that more and more with, for many, many reasons, one of them is with climate change. So fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, but with climate change, a lot of people are forecasting that Canada will actually become an even better place to grow food. Uh, at least a lot of countries are turning to Canada right now, and that's why a lot of it, private investment funds are investing right now into land in Canada. It's becoming a bit of a black gold. Or, um, anyway, uh, so fortunately or unfortunately, uh, because of that, and increasingly in Canada, with the change of government and with a lot of work that has been happening on the ground, there's more and more recognition also that indigenous people in the north uh, should be able to feed themselves and produce food uh, locally uh, to feed themselves and to lower food insecurity. So because of all that, a lot of people right now are putting energy in terms of trying to figure out, well, what are the best ways to grow food in the north and uh, in a cost-effective way, in a way that maybe are, um, have less impact on the environment. Um, Anyway, so th that's what I was referring to, but I'm not a specialist of the North. But I will say that USC Canada actually has a really great, um, it's part of a great program supporting indigenous communities in uh, the prairies, uh, a few of them right now, and hopefully it will scale up to more. But getting them to experiment, grow their local seeds and experiment by crossing breeds um, that are adapted to their climate, like a, a lot of them are actually now introducing also Asian greens, but they're choosing which Asian green they want to introduce in their diet. And I think that's key that they're in, at the center of the decision making process. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of projects like that where they're starting to grow their food and experiment and um, yeah, you could probably talk more about that. I'm not as familiar with the North uh, as I am around here, and I don't, we don't have large-scale farms for First Nations here. I know that they do out west, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really speak to it, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm familiar with the hunting and what cl the impact of climate change on hunting, but not on growing food. Right. So, so the t opportunities are really twofold. On one hand, is there's more um, policy interest to look at food in the North and investment in food in the North, and at the same time, there's communities that are more ready than ever to produce food and to be able to up potentially even make a profit from them. The just communities we work is they want to feed themselves, but they want to eventually maybe also uh, get profit from it, something they were denied in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan? Uh, uh, just that one kind of comment on the flip side of the climate change, because that's really interesting to think about northern climates being more amenable to, to farming. Um, but for the harvesting of uh, animals, for example, so beluga, narwhal, um, the, the ability to store those is becoming much more difficult um, with the loss of permafrost um, and the, the need for freezers that have to run over longer periods of time and where does that, um, the financing come for that. Um, and so I think there's a lot of interesting initiatives around kind of community freezers uh, so that individual households don't have to store um, their, their meat um, and, and bear that cost individually because that's going to be really prohibitive in the future as far as I understand it. Any other comments, Frank? Maybe very quickly, um, uh, not the definition of traditional, traditional farming, um, but aquaculture, uh, in my mind, and in the province's mind, is a farming activity. It's the farming of mm -hmm. fish uh, in the water. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, that is an area that, uh, that the provincial government is, is, is concentrating on with the First Nations people. Uh, I know that uh, Waikagama has a, has a trout farm uh, that uh, uh, is doing quite well. Uh, we've engaged several chiefs that have traveled with us to Norway for a, a large aquaculture conference. And I would suggest that, and, and I don't know much about the north, but I would suggest that, that uh, fish farming or aquaculture is a possibility in the north as well. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth. Here we are. Hi. You have your mic, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Elizabeth. Thank you all for coming in. You were very um, eye-opening and insightful. Um, my question is for Frank. Um, I come from Canton, Nova Scotia, which is a very fishing-dependent town, although technically not a town anymore. Um, and you had talked about a limitation um, for the province being about skilled labor. And one trend that I noticed when I was going to school was that people who were entering into the fishing industry were unskilled and that they mostly came out of high school um, if they even graduated. Um, and so how does the province um, work towards resolving that need for skilled labor with the trend of unskilled labor being so prevalent, um, especially in the fishing industries? 
So it's a good question, and uh, I was trying to find a spot where I could, could make this point. Um, whenever we talk about food policy, you can't talk about food policy in and of itself. Whenever you talk about public policy, there are always uh, other policies that, are, that you need to consider and are impacted. Uh, in this particular case, it's, uh, you know, uh, workforce or, or, or labor policy, if you want to call it that. Education. Education is exactly. Um, the, uh, you know, from a, from a, I think the first thing we have to do is, is to educate people that the um, common belief, I think, even today, that fishing and farming you know, is, is, you know, you got the tractor and, and you're pulling the wagon along or you're out with the, you know, the, uh, the block and tackle type of thing. It is a highly skilled, uh, uh, very innovative uh, industries. And I know that uh, the community college, uh, for one, uh, and the Dal uh, uh, campus for agriculture in Truro uh, are making a difference when it comes to training uh, uh, young people to enter into uh, either farming or fishing. Uh, but the, the gist of it is when you have these discussions, uh, you can't be afraid of saying that a farmer or a fisher can't make a profit. And it, you know, it goes into affordability of food and everything, but the reality is if you're a farmer or you're a fisherman and you can't make a profit, you're not going to be a farmer or a fisherman. So there are a lot of things that come into to consideration, and, and one of them, I think, is uh, people, young people don't see farming and fishing as a future. Right? Uh, any other thoughts? I, well, yeah, it's maybe slightly different than that, but uh, thanks for your comments. I just wanted to say one thing that came to mind is a lot of the, one of the things we've been asking, it's true that sometimes it's unscaled or you know, from not from an agricultural background or fishery background, but sometimes some of the grants that farmers can access to employ people require that the person comes from an agricultural fisher background. However, we've actually, there's been a change now, but we've shown that a lot of the farmers, um, that the people interested in farming don't necessarily come from an ag background, yet we should still be able to hire them and help to improve their skills. And more than that, I think there should be programs to help us retain labor. So once labor is scaled, that we have, like right now, you can have a grant, but it can't apply again to the same person. Um, but wouldn't make sense if a farmer trains someone, make sure to have a program in place that th the next year, maybe it's not 50% of their salary that's covered, but maybe like 5%, so at least to have an incentive. That's a small thing, but just to, uh, the point that you raise um, about the income of farmers is also definitely key. We haven't really addressed it here, but across Canada, most farmers make below the poverty line in terms of mm -hmm. revenue. And when you're a farmer, you grow some food, well, depending on what you grow, you grow some food and it can at least eat part of that. But we really need to think about, about that issue because whether it's a basic income or a top up so that at least they get a certain revenue, it's key because otherwise we won't have new people wanting to go in those sectors in the future. Mm -hmm. I also Amanda? Just, I just want to throw out there that uh, the Nova Scotia Community College does offer training for fishermen. Mm. We recently put one of our, one of the young guys, he's 27, uh, <clears throat> on our boat. We put him through captain's training and mm. we access DFO money for that through the Indigenous programming, but now he is a qualified captain. So they do offer those trainings through Nova Scotia Community College, I believe at the Yarmouth uh, campus. So there's opportunities there um, to mm. gain skills and knowledge that you need. <clears throat> Just curious here, uh, is anyone not in farming but want to go into farming? No? Okay. No! Oh. <laughs> what, I, <laughs> don't, don't let this panel discourage you. There is hope. No, let's go for it. Can I make Frank, my, yeah. um, uh, critical that we continue to have farming and fishing in Nova Scotia. Uh, for those of you that haven't read the one Nova Scotia report uh, by Ray Ivney, who was the chair, uh, those industries, he did not consider them to be sunshine industries, sunrise, sunset industries uh, going by, uh, by the wayside. If we do not have farming and fishing in Nova Scotia, uh, the raw fabric of Nova Scotia, I believe, personally, uh, is going to disappear. And so this urbanization of populations and, and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the shriveling up of the rural economy and people moving away from small town Nova Scotia or rural Nova Scotia 
uh, is going to continue. So uh, it's critical, uh, not only from a food policy perspective, but if you want the fabric of Nova Scotia to stay the, say, the way it is now, uh, mm -hmm. that we need to find solutions. And the Barton report actually is consistent with that as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next is Kelsey. Oh, right next. Hi, my question is also for Frank. Um, invasive species are a real problem here in Canada, impacting fisheries and aquaculture. What impact does this have on food security, and what can we do to mitigate this impact? It, it has a, a, a big impact. Um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, chain pickerel and smallmouth bass uh, are... Uh, uh, did you say invasive species? That was that. Yes, invasive uh, species. Yeah, yeah, invasive species in, in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, if you have ever, if you're a sport fisherman and have ever been to uh, a lake that has chain pickerel or smallmouth bass, the chances are uh, there's nothing else in the lake. Uh, what people may not know was um, back in the 1960s, smallmouth bass was actually introduced. Uh, by the government of the day into Nova Scotia with the idea that it would be a uh, good sport fishery. Uh, and um, I guess in a, it's an example of uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, for all goods and in intentions when it comes to policy decisions, they somehow uh, go awry. Um, but to answer your question, so, um, you know, invasive species such as chain pickerel and small nose bass, Oh, compete all other uh, marine species, marine fish in an environment. Uh, so it has a has a big impact. Um, what are we doing about it? Um, you know, uh, at least from a chain pickerel and and uh, and from a Nova Scotia perspective, chain pickerel we've we've eliminated a bag limit, so you can catch as many as you want. Uh, there's uh, uh, a policy that there's no catch and release, so when you catch them, you don't put them back in the lake. Uh, we also have a, and we don't do this very often, but we also have a method where you can actually <laughs> electrify uh, the body of water. Uh, it essentially kills everything in the water, but if, if the lake is primarily chain pickle, then you can, you can start fresh. It's a big issue, uh, not only invasive species, not only on the fish side, but on the on the farming and the aquaculture side as, uh, as well. Thank you, Frank. Any other thoughts, comments? All right. We'll go to the next student, uh, Ami Reza. Ami Reza. Hi, my name is Reza, and my question is for Genevieve and Frank. And I'm going to read my question to you. <clears throat> what are the differences between an organic farm and a regular farm? Mm. And also, as it can be too expensive to afford for individual farmers, can it be an option for the government to make a crown agency which develops the farms proper for organic farming and sell them as a mortgage to the people who want to start organic farming? All right. I'll let the expert go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, difference, uh, excellent question. I'll try to answer in the best way I can. But the, the biggest difference, and just to <coughs> say, for me, it's important. I'm not trying to be dogmatic at all. But I'm, my point is that in terms of our food future, we need to mo move towards more climate resilient agriculture and practices. Uh, and right now, the from all the research I've seen and heard, two things are absolutely needed. Well, more than two, but the two top ones is we need to re reduce our pesticide use. I'm not saying we ne necessarily need to, well, in my dream world, we wouldn't have any, but um, accompany the farmers to reduce their pesticide use and definitely increase the diversification of our farms. But just to go back to your question, organic really, the, the biggest difference is in organic, you cannot use any synthetic, well, even that's changing in terms of words, but, any chem heart hazardous chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, and the idea in organic agriculture, so because you can't use those up inputs, you have to find other ways to work with nature to build your soil health. It really starts there. And to build with the nature that's already there. So, and also, you cannot use uh, genetic genetically engineered um, seeds. seeds. Um, 
anyway, so those are the biggest. I don't know if you want to go in the details, but I'm happy to talk to you after. <laughs> there's great sites. If you go to cog.ca, cog.ca, there you'll Yeah, there's lots over. of documentation on, on this issue. The difference. Yeah. But in terms of access, uh, right now, I would say that all farmers have a different difficulty accessing land, whether they're organic or not. Uh, your idea of, you know, using crown land and or there's a lot of programs that I think did very similar things to what you've suggested um, in other countries where the, the, the country uh, leases or sells federal land to people wanting to farm and usually <coughs> using specific practices, either organic or by saying that they'll do certain measures to re relieve their footprint. Um, Terre Vive in Italy, I think, is one of the examples that did that. Um, Anyway, my, I'm blanking, but I think it's definitely interesting. But for me, I would say it's not organic. Accessing organic land is not necessarily more difficult than if non-organic land. The difficulty is once you're a farmer, like once you get on the farm, uh, there's definitely a lot less support. That is changing, and Quebec is leading, but a lot more needs to to happen. Um, there's not much support for you if you're organic farmer, whereas there's more support for you if you're not. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know if that's fair. Um, Frank? Partially a bureaucratic answer. I guess when you have a bureaucrat in the room, <laughs> you're going to get at least one bureaucratic answer. So on the difference between organic and, and non-organic, um, uh, if you reference the federal, there are federal regulations oh. which talk about uh, 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 organic farming. And uh, in Nova Scotia, those are the, the, the regulations that are followed. Um, you know, with regards to access, um, you know, I, in some ways, I think organic farming is, is like a, a, a lot of relatively new things, and sometimes it takes a while to catch on. I can tell you that there are that there is a, a growing organic farming organization uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, for anyone who has gone uh, to a farmer's market in, in Nova Scotia, and uh, they are just about everywhere, uh, organic products are a big thing. Um, but with that, you know, there's, there's, there's a caution because, um, you know, many people perceive, and I think rightfully so, that organic products uh, in some way are better for you, and thus you can, you can pay more for them. Uh, <laughs> I have seen or have been told on more and more occasions now where there are products being uh, uh, presented as organic products when in fact they aren't. So, um, you know, that whole policing regulation piece, I think, is also important for organic. Uh, I think I think there's a place for organic farming, quite honestly, and I think it will grow over time. And, and actually right now, if you look at the stats, it's the sector that's thriving the most. It's in, from 2006 to 2016, it tripled in size, and it's we're only seeing that uh, skyrocket even more. But just to go with the claims, you have to know that since 2015, I think, there's a, or more than that, sorry, I'm blanking, 2013, there's um, organic standards in place. So in, in Canada now, across the provinces, there's regular Harmonized standards. Harmonized standards, which is important. That being said, <laughs> Quebec and BC still have provincially even stronger standards. And there is a, a third party that does verify that if you make a claim, um, you are accountable. So I, I don't think there's that many, you know, I think it's actually rare the instances of people saying I have organic products and they're not, especially mm -hmm. now with those harmonized standards. Mm -hmm. We actually have time for one more question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm going to go with the first person. Uh, yes, the red shirt. I'm Jonathan. I'm an MPA student here. My question is for Genevieve, which is, uh, what percentage of our farmers in Canada would you say are not credibly seeking to earn a living from it? Like, I come from a farming-intensive county and could describe probably a dozen operations where the people only want to earn ten or $20,000 a year at the most. So how many aim to do that? Well, I, I think that that would probably skew the figures and make it seem as if more of our farmers are in poverty if a lot of operations are just small where people don't want to make a living from it? No, that's a good question. Actually, there's a... In like hobby farms. hobby farms. Yep. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of hobby farms. However, I would say... It, I, I don't have the numbers for you, and I don't know if anyone I else has know. have the number, uh, but I can tell you for sure... Oh, you do. Well, for Nova Scotia, it's about 60 below... It's about 60% or below 10,000. <laughs> 
pretty small, small problems. Yeah. <coughs> and actually, just to, to put that in perspective, I, I think we need so, to make so, sure. Sorry, what's what's the number? So it's it's and if I remember correctly, it's you know it's between fifty and sixty percent of farms in Nova Scotia are below ten thousand gross income. Okay. The 20, of the three thousand nine hundred we have. Yes. Okay. Wow. Thank gross you. income. Yes, gross income. Yeah. And that's so it, wow. it's really hard to compute those numbers though, because if they only have that in gross income, is that because it's their choice or because they can't grow that market? But it, you're right that for sure hobby farmers will always have a spot. And actually, in Canada, we've had a lot of policies since the 30s trying to specifically dismantle small, medium, and hobby farms. And I think those are always the farms that have fed the communities. We need to make sure they're strong. But I would argue though that a lot of farms are hobby farms not because they want to. They want to be small or medium, but they're, they just need support to get there. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for the question. Uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Again, we, I think we could talk for hours on this topic. Uh, on behalf of the McKechnie Institute, I want to thank uh, the panelists. Uh, I think they've done a great job in, in making us think dif in different ways about, the, about food systems in general. So thank you very much for joining us today. of your day.